Beep. Boop. I am Robot Dr. Mandic. Wouldn't that be weird if your professor was a robot? Maybe someday your professor will be a robot. Or maybe that's just not possible. There's never going to be a robot that's as smart as your professors. <laughs> so, could machines have minds? That's a question that we need to take seriously because we are surrounded by machines. We have all sorts of computers and they do some really impressive stuff. And it gets more impressive every day. And we have to start to worry that maybe one day they will be as smart or maybe even smarter than human beings. And philosophers have been worried about this for hundreds of years and have been arguing about whether you can know a priori that yes, yes, it is possible for there to be an artificial system that is exactly as intelligent as a human being. Or other philosophers argue that no, they could prove a priori that it'll just never be intelligent. It might seem intelligent, it might behave intelligently, but it won't be really intelligent. You might say, well, who cares? Who cares? Like, if it behaves intelligently, isn't that bad enough? So that's an engineering problem. Could you make a machine that is as effective at solving problems as a human being? That's, that's interesting, but it's not philosophical. The philosophical question is the metaphysical question. If there was such a machine, would it follow that it actually does have intelligence? If it acted intelligently and was able to solve all the problems that an intelligent being could solve, would it necessarily thereby have intelligence? That's the metaphysical issue that we're going to be dealing with today. And we're going to be getting at it by talking about um, some arguments. The central argument in today's lecture is going to be a famous argument from the philosopher John Searle called the Chinese Room Argument. And there's a way of understanding the Chinese Room Argument is as a response to something that comes from the mathematician and computer scientist Alan Turing and something that gets referred to as the Turing test, Turing's test for artificial intelligence. There's some other arguments we're going to examine, some other concepts you need to know about as well, but it really is going to be mostly about Searle and Turing, and we could roughly view Searle and Turing as being on opposite sides of the issue about artificial intelligence where the Turing side is representing a pro view. They're saying, yes, there could be genuine intelligence even though it's artificial. And the cons say no. They agree with John Searle that it's just never going to happen. Okay, so we've got a couple parts to today's lecture. Part one, we're going to be talking about AI, which stands for artificial intelligence, and two theses the weak AI thesis and the strong AI thesis, and another thing known as functionalism. That's all going to be in part one. In part two, we're going to get into Turing and some of the key ideas associated with Alan Turing, namely the idea of a Turing machine and the idea of the Turing test. Then we're going to get into Searle's famous argument, the Chinese room argument. And then we're going to come up with like a counter argument, um, probably one of the best arguments for artificial intelligence, at least philosophically speaking, and that's something known as the silicon chip replacement argument. In a lot of ways, it's like the opposite of the Searle Chinese room argument. Okay, so let's get, let's get into it. So here is John Searle, and John Searle famously drew a distinction between two different artificial intelligence theses. One of them he called weak artificial intelligence, the weak program of artificial intelligence. Weak artificial intelligence is the thesis that an artificial system can simulate intelligence without truly replicating it. Strong AI is the claim that an artificial system can be genuinely intelligent, even though it isn't natural. It's not natural, it's artificial, but nonetheless it's genuinely intelligent. So um, on strong AI, on the strong AI view, artificial intelligence is kind of like a synthetic diamond. A synthetic diamond is still a diamond. It just wasn't naturally made. Um, but on weak AI, uh, artificial intelligence is like margarine. Margarine is not butter. 
it's like a substitute for butter. It simulates some of the properties of butter, but it's not butter. Margarine is not synthetic butter. Margarine is, it's margarine. Um, in connection with all this stuff is a very important idea known as functionalism. So the thesis of strong AI, the thesis that an artificial system can be genuinely intelligent even though it isn't natural, is closely related to a view about the mind-body problem known as functionalism. And functionalism is very similar to an idea that we get from Aristotle and we've been exposed to several times in this semester, starting with lecture seven, but it has come up since then too. So the idea of functionalism, we might put like this. Uh, number one, mental states are multiply realizable. Uh, another way of putting that is that mental states are substrate independent. Um, you can have a mental state in a biological brain, or you can have a mental state in a computer system made not out of biological components, but made out of microchips. So the idea of multiple realizability, we might illustrate in terms of other sorts of things, like for example, mouse traps. A mouse trap can be made out of wood and metal, or you can make a mouse trap out of a piece of paper with glue on it, and the mouse gets stuck in the glue. What makes all these various devices count as mouse traps is that they perform a certain function, and we might define the function in terms of various input and output states. If you input a live mouse, it will output a dead mouse. And you might say, what about friendly mouse traps? And we might say, okay, uh, you input a free mouse, and you output a captured mouse. That's what it makes something a mouse trap. It doesn't matter what you make it out of as long as it gets the job done. You might say this is similarly true of baseball bats. You can have an aluminum baseball bat or a wooden baseball bat. As long as it's able to hit a baseball, um, it's a bat. As long as it performs that function, it's a bat. It doesn't matter what it's made out of. Some things in life are multiply realizable, like bats and mouse traps, and other things aren't multiply realizable. Like, for example, a diamond is not multiply realizable. There's a lot of different ways to, to put a diamond together, but every diamond has to be made out of carbon, and the carbon atoms have to be arranged into a tetrahedral lattice. If you don't have that, it's not a diamond. If someone gives you a shiny rock that is not made out of carbon, it's just like cubic zirconium or something like that, then you should not marry that person because they're trying to pull one over on you. That is not a real diamond. But a synthetic diamond is a real diamond. It's just not a natural diamond. So diamonds are not multiply realizable. Same with water. Water is not multiply realizable. There's only one way to get water, and it's got to be H2O. you got to have hydrogen and oxygen and mixed in a certain ratio, too. Two parts hydrogen to one part oxygen. That's the only way to have water. Um... So some things in life are multiply realizable, other things aren't. And the question is, are minds multiply realizable? And the functionalists say, yes, they are multiply realizable. And if they are multiply realizable, that would seem to support the thesis of strong artificial intelligence, that intelligence can be realized not just in a biological brain, but also in an artificial electronic computer. One way of understanding the, the claims made by strong AI and functionalism is to say that the relationship between the mind and the brain is like the relationship between software and hardware. So this is kind of like what Aristotle was saying when he said that if the eye were an animal, sight would be its soul. For this animal, the eyeball man, sight is something that the eyeball is doing. Well, software is something that your computer hardware is doing. And... Um, so you've got this machine, this physical system that's made out of all these different switches and, and wires and parts, and they do different things. And when they do different things, they're running different pieces of software. And further, you can have one in the same piece of software running on different hardware. You can get Microsoft Word to run on a, on a Apple computer, or you can have it run on a, a PC. Um, you can even go into Minecraft and, and make a computer out of the blocks inside of Minecraft. And then you would, what you're really doing, since Minecraft itself is a computer program, Minecraft is software, is you have made a software emulation of a computer that's running inside of software. And some of you know about emulators. You can have a software emulation of, of uh, one kind of hardware that allows you to run some other kind of software. And you get layers and layers of like virtual computers running on virtual machines. And wow, maybe we are in the matrix right now. 
Anyway, John Searle famously, famously, famously argues against both functionalism and strong AI. And we're going to come back and talk about his powerful argument and whether it's ultimately a good argument. But let's talk a little bit about his target. So we say he argues against strong AI, AI and functionalism, but we can also say part of what he's doing is arguing against Turing. So let's find out what Turing is all about. So, uh, by the way, there's a movie called The Imitation Game about the life of Alan Turing. Alan Turing was a pretty cool guy, and he um, was a, a important part of World War II. Uh, he was a British mathematician that helped invent computers, and he did a bunch of like really excellent and important work on code breaking, and he helped break an, a really important Nazi code during World War II and helped the Allies win World War II. Um, he also was famously persecuted homosexual, and uh, the British government did really nasty things during to him during his life, and made uh, made him undergo because uh, like at the time it was illegal to be gay, and he was forced by the government to like undergo hormone therapy to try to make him straight, and he ultimately committed suicide, and uh, it was very tragic, uh, and I th I think that eventually like maybe just a few years ago, the British government finally like issued an apology and said, like, yeah, that was a really crappy thing that we did to this war hero, Alan Turing. Anyway, part of what Alan Turing did was to basically invent computers. He, he was interested in a mathematical puzzle, and the mathematical puzzle had to do with computing. And uh, one way of thinking about what computing is, before there were electronic computers, what people meant by computing was something like solving puzzles, solving math problems. You compute the solution. And he proposed that um, every, every computable function, every math function uh, that can be computed in the sense of being able to be figured out, could be computed by a mechanical procedure, what he called an effective procedure. And he invented the idea of a Turing machine to help prove this computability thesis and now he didn't build a machine he just like thought of the basic components of this machine and he said like imagine there's a machine that is able to do the following basic things it's able to write symbols down it's able to read symbols it's able to erase symbols and it does that it does all that symbol reading writing and erasing by following a set program that tells us what to do uh, there's a set program uh, known as a lookup table, which is making this machine, which we can think of as a read-write head that is going back and forth along a big tape, and is reading symbols and writing symbols, all in accordance with this program that's being written. He's saying, like, that basic machine, which is a Turing machine, that, that machine could be programmed to just follow a basic mechanical procedure, and that would be able to solve any computable mathematical function. So any, any computable mathematical function can be computed by a Turing machine. He proved that. And in a sense, he proved then that vast swaths of mathematics are doable by machines. And once that was in place, people went and were able to build electronic computers that were able to do this. And so, so much of the way computers work is you take some problem in life and then you turn it into math. And once you've turned it into math, now you're halfway there to turning it into something that a machine can do. You don't need a person to do it anymore. Now, along the way, Turing contemplates the question of whether you can have machines not only solve math problems, but solve general problems. Could you have machines that could do everything that you would regard an intelligent being as able to do? And he proposed that one way you would resolve that is by seeing if the machines could pass a test that he called the imitation game, but later gets referred to as the Turing test. In his imitation game, you've got, um, I, I forgot exactly how it goes, something like you've got a person and they're interacting with uh, a computer and also a real person, and the computer and a real person are, are, are I forgot how it goes, he's supposed to, the, the person C is supposed to guess the gender of the people, I don't know, but um, the, the chemically pure, pure version of this is simply what now gets referred to as the Turing test. If a person 
was having a conversation by, say, text. You're having a text chat with somebody. Not a video chat where you're looking at a face or anything like that. Just a text chat where you're typing in and receiving typed messages. Could you fool this person about whether they are having a text chat with a real person or instead having a text chat with a computer? If the computer is able to fool them into thinking that it's actually a person, then the computer has passed the Turing test. And the essence of the Turing test is you've removed all sorts of aspects that might bias you. Like, we've, we're, you're not looking at their body to see if they're intelligent. You're just looking at the, their verbal or linguistic outputs. Because, like, well, who cares about bodies anyway if we're talking about intelligence? So what if they are a slimy octopus? If a space alien came and was able to talk to us about like how to cure cancer, we would say, thank you, space alien, you intelligent being. You wouldn't say, uh, ignore that slimy thing. It doesn't look like a person. So similarly with the Turing test, you're trying to ignore irrelevant superficial details and trying to get at the heart of intelligence. But you might wonder, is passing the Turing test really a good test? Is that the best we can do in deciding that something is intelligent? Searle argues famously that no, the Turing test is not a good test. Something could pass the Turing test without actually being intelligent. And that is something that is codified in Searle's Chinese room argument. The basic Chinese room argument can be conveyed in terms of this thought experiment, which is the at the heart of the argument, this thought experiment of Searle's Chinese room. And what I'm going to do now is instead of telling you about this myself, I'm going to show you a video of me telling you about it myself, but it's from 2014. So I've already recorded a video about this stuff. I'm just going to show it to you because I, I still like it. I still think it's pretty good. Um, and I don't know what else to say except enjoy uh, going back in time to the year 2014. And I'll see you. Um, I'll see you in a little bit. I'll, I'm going to be here in the year 2018 while you travel back to the year 2014 and see a uh, much younger Pete Mandic talk about Searle's Chinese room argument against artificial intelligence. Enjoy. In this brief video, I'm going to give a, an overview of John Searle's Chinese room argument. If you're already familiar with the argument, then you might want to just skip to a longer video I made called Brains, Machines, and Intentionality, where I get into some topics related to Searle's Chinese Room argument and uh, criticisms of it. However, if you'd like a refresher, or you just don't know what the Chinese Room argument is all about, then this video is for you. So, one way of understanding John Searle's Chinese Room argument is that it's an argument against the possibility of artificial intelligence. It's arguing that you cannot make an artificial system, you cannot make a, a machine that would have genuine intelligence. At best, all you're gonna get is a simulation. You're gonna get something that goes through the motions but doesn't actually have genuine intelligence. This argument can also be viewed as not only an argument against artificial intelligence, but you could also view it as an argument against the closely related view of functionalism. Functionalism is basically the idea that mental states are definable in terms of causal relations between mental states and also sensory inputs and behavioral outputs. So these kinds of causal relations are what defines mental states. And what doesn't define mental states is anything that would be specific to brains. So a functionalist allows for the multiple realizability of mental states. As long as something has the same general coarse-grained causal profile, it can have genuine intelligence. So that's functionalism, and it sounds a lot like artificial intelligence, at least the thesis known as strong artificial intelligence, that says that there can be a machine that, even though it's artificial, can have genuine intelligence. So how does John Searle's Chinese Room argument work? At the heart of the Chinese Room argument is a thought experiment. In this thought experiment, John Searle invites you to imagine that someone comes out with a computer program that is supposed to allow a computer running the program to conduct a conversation with somebody 
in some dialect of uh, the Chinese, uh, one of the Chinese languages. Instead of imagining that this computer program is going to converse in Chinese with somebody by running a robot that has a mouth and is able to produce audible speech, imagine instead this computer program is interfacing with its interlocutors via written or printed text. So um, this might be thought of as a program that would be a kind of a chat bot. It's something that you could um, ask questions to by typing and it could reply by printing answers on a screen or printing them out on a piece of paper. Imagine computer scientists develop a program that is so sophisticated that it passes a Turing test. People interacting with the program by some kind of textual interface wouldn't know that it was a program. They might be fooled into thinking that they're conversing with a genuine human who understands Chinese. So imagine a chatbot that's really sophisticated, sophisticated enough to pass a Turing test for Chinese understanding. Now, Searle says, here's the thought experiment part. Imagine that that program is, instead of typed into a computer to make a computer run the program, that program is instead written out in English, and the program is followed by John Searle, an actual human being, not a machine. John Searle works with the program that is written out in a book. And the way in which he runs the program or follows the program is by being inside of this room, this is the Chinese room, and messages in Chinese are sent into the room through an in slot. And John Searle, who we are hypothesizing or stipulating, um, doesn't understand Chinese, he only understands English, he receives these Chinese messages and he doesn't understand them. He looks at them and um, looks in his book. The book has pictures of different Chinese symbols and instructions written in English telling him what Chinese symbols to send out of the room in response to the Chinese symbols that come into the room. Someone on the outside of the room might think that they're having a conversation with somebody that understands Chinese. But really what they're doing, according to John Searle, is they're just interacting with a system that doesn't understand Chinese. In a sense, they're interacting with John Searle, and he doesn't understand Chinese. All he understands is English, and he's following the instructions written in English. In following these instructions, he is running a program, a program that is supposed to be a Chinese understanding program. If this thought experiment is coherent, what we have here is the program being run without anything or anyone thereby understanding Chinese. And according to Searle, this defeats the position of artificial intelligence, or the position known as strong artificial intelligence, that says there could be a machine that has genuine intelligence instead of just weak artificial intelligence, which says that at best you're gonna get a simulation, um, something that goes through the motions without having genuine intelligence. So the argument goes against strong intelligence in the following way. According to strong artificial intelligence, anything that runs the program, the Chinese understanding program, will thereby understand Chinese. Running the program suffices for understanding Chinese. A computer that runs the program would understand Chinese. But, says John Searle, he is running the program without himself understanding Chinese. So therefore, it's not true that anything that runs the program would thereby understand Chinese. John Searle is running the program without himself understanding Chinese. In my longer video on this topic, Brains, Machines, and Intentionality, I get into some of the criticisms that have come up about Searle's Chinese room argument. But very briefly, here's one that John Searle himself discusses. It's a response to the Chinese room argument known as the systems reply. According to the systems reply, someone defends artificial intelligence against the Chinese room argument by saying the following. Well, okay, John Searle doesn't understand Chinese. He's paging through the instruction book written in English. He's following instructions. All he understands is English. He doesn't understand Chinese. However, the entire system of which John Searle is just a part, that whole system understands Chinese. The whole system includes not just 
John Searle, but also the book that has the instructions. And perhaps the system also includes the symbols coming into and leaving the room. So this whole system, the system that has John Searle as a proper part, but also includes the book with the rules in it, and also the symbols that are being manipulated, it's that whole system that understands Chinese. So according to the system's reply, the defender of artificial intelligence says, okay, so what if John Searle doesn't understand Chinese? John Searle, strictly speaking, is not what's running the program. What's running the program is the whole system, and the whole system understands Chinese. So John Searle has a reply to the system's response. He says, okay, forget about the actual room, and forget about the book. Imagine that John Searle memorizes all the instructions in the book. And instead of receiving symbols through some slot in the room, the symbols are just shown to him. So someone holds up a message written in Chinese, and he looks at it, and he thinks through his memory of the instructions of this book that he's memorized. And he's memorized all the pictures that are in the book. He's, remember, he's memorized all the instructions written out in English about what sort of response to give to certain Chinese inputs. And he thinks through and he um, realizes that given this one particular Chinese symbol, which he matches to a picture in his memory, he should respond with another Chinese symbol. And he produces the Chinese symbol by just drawing it on a piece of paper. So now what John Searle has done is he's internalized the system. He is no longer a proper part of a system that includes a book and the rest of the things in the room. But the system is something that is inside of him now because he's memorized all the instructions in the book. And you're just showing him symbols and then he's writing or drawing on a piece of paper. And even though he doesn't understand the symbols, He's producing the correct symbols in response to uh, the symbols that are shown to him. So Searle says, once again, we have the program being run without anything or anyone thereby understanding Chinese. The defender of artificial intelligence can't say that Searle now is just a part of the system because he is the whole system. He's, he is the entire system. He is the thing that results in the right symbol responses to various symbols that are shown to him, but he doesn't understand Chinese. Okay, welcome back. So now that we're gonna shift and talk about this other argument, and this is an argument in favor of strong artificial intelligence. It's something known as the silicon chip replacement argument. It also gets referred to as the prosthetic neurons argument. And the basic idea at the heart of this argument is to say, look, couldn't we replace different parts of a biological brain with mechanical parts and still have intelligence? And wouldn't that prove then that artificial intelligence is possible? But let's take this a little bit more slowly, this central thought experiment, and first talk about different prostheses. Um, you are familiar with the idea of like a prosthetic leg, and you might know that some prosthetics are very advanced. So there are some prosthetics that are allow like a prosthetic hand or prosthetic leg to be connected to the nervous system of a person. We have now uh, prosthetic limbs that can be controlled by the brain. And you might say that eventually we could have prosthetic eyes and prosthetic ears. What an eye is doing basically is what a camera is doing and, and it should in theory be possible that if you got your eye damaged or destroyed in some kind of accident, we could take a video camera and replace your eye and take the wires from the back of the video camera and hook it up to the nerves in your optic nerve, which is ultimately connected to your brain. We have a lot of the technology in place right now. Um, and, uh, you know, you already appreciate how amazing our electronic devices are, like the iPhone. You know, the iPhone for several generations now of iPhone has had something called the retina display. And the reason they call it a retina display is because a retina is a part of your eye that allows you to see and uh, it allows you to see. And um, the resolution of the screen is such that uh, if held at a normal um, length away from your face, uh, you, it, it is, uh, you cannot see the grain the resolution of the uh, of the image when held at arm's length it is at or exceeds the resolution of the human retina. 
So that means that image is, uh, is able to fool the eye. There's nothing that you would see in the resolution of that image that would tell you that it is an image as opposed to the real deal. So we already have visual displays that are able to exceed, um, to match or exceed the resolution of the human vision. For, for years and years and years, our audio recordings are able to um, fully capture everything that an ear would be able to, to pick up. You wouldn't be able to distinguish a really good audio recording from a re the, the real deal. And similarly, we can have electronic devices, in theory, that could replace the eye or replace the ear. You could get a prosthetic nose. You could get a prosthetic hand, in theory, that not only um, allows your brain to squeeze the hand uh, via the nerves, but also everywhere where you've got sensors in your real hand that tell you about pressure and temperature, you could have electronic sensors, because we already have electronic thermometers. Why not have little pressure sensors and, and little thermometers in their hand? So when you take your prosthetic robot hand and you stick it in some hot water, it gives you a feeling in your, in your mind of like really sticking a hand into hot water. And you might imagine a scenario like someone like Darth Vader from Star Wars where they lose different parts of their biological body and they get replaced with different prosthetics. And one prosthetic technology that already exists is prosthetic brain parts. Already scientists have successfully put prosthetic chips into rat brains that replace, for, for example, portions of the hippocampus that are responsible for spatial memory. The hippocampus is very important for learning like how to, how to make your way through a maze and that's something that you can get a rat to do. A rat can learn what the shortest path is to get to the cheese in a maze. And um, scientists have made microchips that are able to perform the same function as that neural tissue, that brain tissue, and they replace the brain tissue with those brain chips in the rat and the rat is able to learn the stuff they were able to learn with their natural brain. And we might imagine a future scenario in which we replace each of the neurons in your brain with a microchip that is able to do the same thing that your neuron was doing. What, your, what each neuron in your brain is doing is just taking signals in and then giving signals back out. And in theory, you can have a microchip that does that. And so um, every input that goes into you gets relayed to all these different neurons that process that information and then they make you behave in the way that you do. If you were slowly replacing your brain neurons, your brain cells with microchips, you wouldn't say anything that you wouldn't have said before. By which I mean, imagine this, before this procedure of getting all your brain parts replaced with microchips, if we asked you what your phone number is, you're going to give the right answer. And then as we replace your brain parts with microchips and we ask you at various stages of the procedure, what's your phone number, you're going to continue to give the right answer. Why? Well, because the answer is something given with your mouth. What makes your mouth move is the nerves in your brain sending signals. And the nerves in your brain are being replaced by microchips that will send the same signals. The microchips are also storing information in, in exactly the same way that your brain cells are able to store information, just like the microchip that we put in the rat brain that allows it to learn to navigate a maze, all the different memory chips that are put in your brain are going to be able to store information just as well as, as the brain. So you wouldn't notice any difference as we replace you, your different parts with microchips, just like if you went to sleep and replaced your eyes with high fidelity video cameras, when you woke up, you wouldn't be able to see any difference. If, if the cameras had the same color resolution as the human eye, the same focal power as the human eye, and was sending the same signals to the optic nerve that the eye was able to send, just by looking at things, you wouldn't be able to know that we had replaced your eyes with video cameras. And similarly, if we replaced your hands with advanced robotic hands, as long as those robotic hands had all the had thermometers that were de able to detect all the temperatures that your hands are able to detect and pressure sensors that have the exact same response profiles as the pressure sensors in your natural biological hands then just by touching things with your new hands you wouldn't be able to feel any different there would be no difference that you could feel and so um the argument goes we could replace each part of your brain with things that are not biological and you would still have all the same mental properties and you would retain your intelligence 
And the resulting system, after we did that, would be an artificial intelligence. And so therefore, artificial intelligence is possible. Strong artificial intelligence is possible. One interesting parallel between the, the Searle argument and the prosthetic neurons argument, that is uh, the Chinese room argument and the prosthetic neurons argument, in both cases, you are doing a thought experiment in, when you're th in which you're thinking about yourself and you're think trying to think about intelligence from the inside. In the Searle argument, you think about intelligence from the inside and you could allegedly lack Chinese understanding uh, even though you're following the program. And with the prosthetic neurons argument, you are paying attention to your intelligence from the inside while your biological aspects are being replaced by a artificial substrate. So both of them are directly trying to address questions of subjectivity. Which one of them do you think is stronger? Do you find the Searle argument against artificial intelligence to be the stronger argument? Or do you think the prosthetic neurons argument in favor of artificial intelligence is the stronger argument? Or do you have completely separate reasons for either believing or disbelieving in the possibility of artificial intelligence. That might be something that you want to write a paper on. But anyway, uh, it's time now to deal with some study questions. Study question number one. According to the system's reply to Searle's Chinese room argument, A, Searle is not actually running the program all by himself. B, Searle is a mere part of a larger system, a system that also includes the cards and the rule book and perhaps the whole rest of the Chinese room. C, it is irrelevant that Searle doesn't understand Chinese. The whole system of which he is part does understand Chinese. D, all of the above. E, none of the above. Study question two. In the silicon chip replacement thought experiment, A, hypothetical mental states are posited to explain what's common in both trying and succeeding in trying but failing to perform some action. B, hypothetical beings are posited that are behaviorally, physically, or functionally similar to normal humans but are devoid of consciousness or qualia. C. Alan Turing talks to a computer consisting of a programmable finite state machine controlling a read-write head that moves back and forth along an infinite tape, reading, writing, and erasing symbols on that tape. D. If a silicon chip is damaged within 60 days of purchase, it will be replaced by a neuron of equal value. Or E. Each of the neurons in your brain is replaced by a silicon microchip that performs the same functions as the neuron it replaces, namely receiving signals from and sending signals to its neighboring units. Study question three. A machine that despite being manufactured has the genuine ability to think and perhaps the ability to feel. What is that? Is that A, the system's reply, B, artificial intelligence, C, Turing test, D, a steampunk bacon stretcher, or E, systematicity? And here are the answers to questions one, two, and three. The answers are D, E, and B. Okay, this is robot. Dr. Mandic saying beep boop. <laughs>